Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Otavio Ferraz. I'm the co-director of the Transnational Law Institute and also an affiliate of the Brazil Institute, both here at King's College London. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, so many of you in this uh, Valentine's Day evening uh, here uh, in the so-called uh, white old male dead room. <laughs> uh, for the final uh, signature, signature lecture of this year of the Transnational Law Institute, the Transnational Law uh, Institute signature lectures is the flagship event of our institute and is delivered by world-renowned scholars on the most pressing transnational issues of uh, our age. We live uh, in a hugely polarized world in which for many life has become longer and better than in any other time in history, whereas for many others it is still nasty, brutish and short, to quote a famous British philosopher <laughs> of the 16th and 17th century. Even those who would supposedly fall into the privileged side of that divide, like us, for instance, increasingly feel their lives and the world are getting worse, not better. They point to the rising inequality experienced almost everywhere in the world in the past few decades, the growth of suffering and displacement in bloody conflicts uh, like Syria and Yemen, the migration and refugee crisis, uh, which is larger, uh, as it has uh, ever been in history, the resilient brutality and corruption of authoritarian regimes and the growth of populism around the world, and the ever more visible effects of environmental destruction and climate change. So the series this year uh, is uh, dedicated to these broad topics of inclusion and exclusion, and in particular, the long-standing contention that law is both complicit and instrumental in both silencing critique but also empowering resistance and change. Cloaked in transcendent, transcendent principles of universality, law should be and often is able to help but also often fails the most vulnerable, most marginalized and the most disempowered people. So I couldn't think of a better person to deliver our final lecture in the series than Professor Katrin Seeking uh, on her most recent book, Evidence for Hope, Making Human Rights Work in the 21st Century, which is probably the most rigorous scrutiny of a claim that has become increasingly popular uh, recently that human rights law doesn't work. So what is for many uh, uh, the, the, the best hope we have to counter all the problems that I started mentioning uh, here this evening uh, has not worked. And if that's truly the case, then I think we should be, be really getting depressed and pessimistic. But as you will uh, hear uh, soon tonight, and the title of her uh, excellent book already indicates, uh, she is a more optimistic uh, person than uh, all the other uh, critics that have written on this recently. So without much further ado, I want to introduce uh, Catherine uh, to deliver uh, this talk, and then afterwards I will introduce Professor Stephen Hopgood, who is, uh, I think it's fair to say, not entirely convinced by uh, Catherine Seeking's uh, arguments, but perhaps after the whole day we had in the next room just before that, which I think is a testament to the generosity of Katrin that she's been discussing this with us since uh, 10 this morning. Perhaps after that whole day, he is a bit more convinced. We'll see. I don't know what he's going to talk about tonight. So Katrin Seeking is the Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School uh, of Government and the Carol Fordsheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She works on international norms and institutions, transnational advocacy networks, the impact of human rights law and policies, and transitional justice. 
Her widely acclaimed and prize-winning books and publications include not only this one evidence for hope, but also the Justice Cascade, How Human Rights Prosecutions Are Changing World Politics, which was awarded the Robert Kennedy Center Book Award and the Wola Duke University Award. Mixed Signals, U.S. Human Rights Policy in Latin America. Activists Beyond Borders, Beyond Borders, Advocacy Networks in International Politics, which is co-authored with Margaret Keck, and was awarded the Graham Meyer Award for Ideas for Improving World Order, and the ISA Chadwick Alger Award for the best book in the area of international organizations, and has been cited no less. I was checking that, and for those of you who are academics, you understand the importance of that, 19,000 times. Uh, and The Persistent Power of Human Rights from Commitment to Compliance, which is co-edited with Thomas Risse and Stephen uh, Rock. She holds an MA and a PhD from Columbia University, has been a Fulbright Scholar in Argentina, and a Guggenheim Fellow. She is a member of the American, Political, American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Council of Foreign, uh, on Foreign Relations and a member of the Editorial Board of International Studies Quarterly, International Organization, and the American Political Science Review. To finish, if that's not uh, yet enough, she has just delivered the prestigious uh, Yale Castle Lecture Series last year, and a book on these lectures is coming out soon, entitled Embracing Responsibility in the Age of Human Rights. So, Catherine, I'm really, really pleased that you came here to speak with us tonight, and uh, all to you, like, for your lecture. Thank you. Well, first, thank you so much, Octavio, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's Valentine's Day, but I can't promise you to talk anything about love but at least we can talk about hope. So, um, and I wanted actually to thank uh, Octavio for organizing this event. Uh, and I want to thank the Transnational Law Institute uh, and John Tasoulis with his, um, I got the name right here, the Philosophy, Politics, and Law Group uh, for co-sponsoring the event. But also the, uh, we did, I, we had this, for me, really, really interesting all day event. Some of the speakers are still here. Some of the commentators are still here, which shows their generosity, I think. Uh, so Anthony Pereira, for example, and Life Weiner. And, and I want a special thanks to Stephen Hopgood for not only sitting through this day, but for coming back uh, this evening. And, uh, and it, we all know it always makes for a more lively discussion when we don't always agree with one another. So thanks for being here, Stephen. Um, So I felt like I had to write this book, Evidence for Hope, and I had to write it because there was this tremendous pessimism in the world about the legitimacy and effectiveness of human rights law, institutions, and movements. And so the book has two parts. One is about legitimacy, and the second is about the effectiveness. I'm going to talk this evening only about the second part of the book, about effectiveness. Um, So I got started because I uh, was hearing this pessimism about human rights from people who were writing books that had titles like The End Times of Human Rights. That's what Stephen Hopgood wrote. Uh, the, uh, people like Eric Posner here who wrote a book called The Twilight of Human Rights Law. And then there were blogs that had names like The Death of Human Rights, uh, The Demise of International Criminal Law, etc. Um, and so, just to give you a flavor of this, Eric Posner writes in this book, and here I'm quoting, Colin, countries solemnly intone their commitment to human rights and ratify endless international treaties and conventions designed to signal that commitment. At the same time, there has been no marked decrease in human rights violations. The law doesn't work. We should face that fact and move on. Now, this pessimism is not only by people like Eric Posner, academics. Uh, this is former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And at a 2016 World Humanitarian Summit, he said, and I quote, uh, we have reached a level of human suffering without parallel since the founding of the United Nations. 
Now, he was speaking at the height of the refugee crisis. I know he was thinking about the refugee crisis, but he didn't condition his terms saying, uh, we uh, have more suffering by these refugees who are on the move. He, he just made a broad statement, more suffering in the world. Now, we don't know exactly how to define suffering, but some of the data that I'm using comes from the uh, United Nations, in fact. So, so here's the head of the United Nations, in some ways, uh, a claiming is more suffering when his, some of his specialized agencies are producing a lot of evidence to the contrary. So we sort of wonder why, why this pessimism? Finally, the pessimism is not, is also in public opinion. So here's a poll conducted of uh, 18,000 people in 17 countries and asked, all things considered, do you think the world is getting better or worse or neither better or worse? And it turns out, and I, you can't see this well, but only two countries in the world did a majority of people, and that's China and Indonesia, they're at the top, did a majority of people think it was either, the world was either getting better or staying the same. And in the rest of the countries, you'll see the kind of little turquoise group, tiny percentages of people thought the world was getting better. So in my country, the United States, 6%, in Great Britain, 4% of, uh, of people thought the world was getting better. Now, um, I am not talking about current events. In fact, I'm going to talk about something called recency bias. And that is, we all pay more attention to recent events. And certainly, recent events in my country have not made me optimistic. Okay? And I understand that something similar is going on here in the UK. Uh, so, but what I, so I'm try, not trying to say, oh, I personally feel good about politics in the United States today. I do not. Okay? Uh, but I'm trying to look at this, this longer term claim that Ban Ki-moon or that Eric Posner made that says that things are worse today than uh, ever before since the founding of the United Nations. And, 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 and so I'm a social scientist, I believe in, in testing hypotheses, and so I went out and began to gather as much data as I could gather. On you, gathering data on anything that we could claim would might be a good uh, measure of whether or not human rights uh, uh, violations are going up or whether we see improvements in human rights. And I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. But the overview is that uh, these broad general statements like Ban Ki-moon or Eric Posner I found to be uh, as inaccurate and unhelpful. Because in many, we have to go issue by issue. And on many human rights issues, if we look over the long term, we can find data indicating that there have been improvements. On other issues, like the refugee issue, there have, as we know, there have been a worsening. There are indeed more refugees on the move today than at any time since World War II. Um, so I decided that I needed to sort of write up the results of my book to be able to share with people some of what I was finding. And, and then, I had, I had to ask myself this question, and that is, if I'm finding a lot more evidence for hope, why is it that people in the world are so deeply pessimistic and dissatisfied with what's going on? And so a big part of this talk is actually going to be turning to that question, and that is, what's going on that makes us perceive, makes the, not just the people of the world, makes 3% of the people in France and Australia uh, uh, think that the world is getting better. Okay, so we're not only talking about people living in desperate human rights situations here, we're talking about some of the people living in the most privileged countries of the world. Um, okay, then this has, one reason I'm so concerned about this is it has a big effect on human rights workers as well. And that is human rights activists and workers themselves feel pessimistic. And uh, we know that people who work in human rights are more likely to suffer from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. They vicariously can suffer from trauma. Uh, but this research found that that depression and, and, and post-traumatic stress disorder was exacerbated by a perception of their own lack of effectiveness. And so as you see here, if you say people who feel they made a positive difference through their work, uh, who, people who who answer negatively that question, 
were more prone to experience uh, uh, PTSD. So this optimum pessimism is not just like temperament, you know, glass half empty, glass half full. Some of us are pessimists, some of us are optimists. It's, it's really a deeper question of, uh, of whether people can have the, uh, how can I say, have the knowledge and the, the ability to continue to work on behalf of human rights. It's not a, a trivial issue. Um, so one of the things I want to begin with is a lot of it has to do with how we measure the human rights progress. And, and the three main measurement types, but I'm focusing on two here, and one is called comparison of the, what I call comparison to the ideal. And this is the most common in the human rights world. And that is people say, we wrote these treaties, they set out these amazing goalposts for us, and we fall so short of those goalposts. I would say it's the most common form of reason in the human rights movement to say, here is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights written 70 years ago in 1948, and we still are falling short. As a social scientist, I prefer empirical comparisons. And that is, instead of saying, here's you know, what the Human Rights Treaty says, I like to look at how far have we come over time. And so if Ban Ki-moon says, we're more suffering today than at the founding of the UN, I say, OK, let's start in 45. Let's uh, track it to the present, and let's see whether there really is evidence of more suffering. That would be my empirical comparisons. Um, so now, this is the point. In, if we do it in some cases, track over time, we see a, a negative information. This is democratic decline in the United States, according to Freedom House. Um, and the peop but if we start putting it over a little bit more time, we see that the, um, so the green mark shows countries that Freedom House calls free. The yellow is partly free, and the blue is not free. And so we realize that today, in 2017, there has been this decline. See the decline in the green, which shows there's some worrisome decline about, about the number of free countries in the world, about democracy in the world. Um, and, but if we compare it to 1987 or 1997, we actually see that we're not talking about democracy being worse than 1987. We're saying there seems to have been a decline between 2007 and 2017. But if we look at it a different way, this is from uh, my, my, my favorite British tweeter, uh, Max Roser, Our World in Data. I don't know how many of you follow him. But um, he, uh, this is using the polity four scale of a democracy. There are a number of citizens, world citizens, living under different political regimes. And again, the green is a democracy. The orange and yellow are different forms of semi-democracy. And the, the red is autocracy. And then the purple is colonialism. Okay, um, And so what we see here, again, if you look over the longer term, about, you might feel worried about democracy, we should be worried about democracy, but we shouldn't forget this longer term process, and particularly very marked from the founding of the United Nations in 1945 to the present of a dramatic growth in democracy. Um, now, I have long been concerned with how to measure the effectiveness of human rights, and so my a, a book, two books I wrote with colleagues in 99, edited volumes, 99 and 2013, used mainly qualitative case studies and, and found evidence that human rights law uh, was, when reinforced by transnational and domestic advocacy, led to improvements in human rights. Um, but then a, a colleague, Beth Simmons, who's my colleague at Harvard, uh, did a quantitative analysis looking and testing the, the impact of human rights law. And she found, using quantitative methods, that, that human rights law, under certain conditions, could lead to improvements in human rights. Um, but still, there's a big disagreement in the literature on this issue of effectiveness. Okay? It's really not resolved, which is why I felt it was important to write this book. Um, and one reason it's not resolved has to do with what, again, an earlier work I called the information paradox. One of the things the human rights movement does is it produces more and more information all the time. It calls attention to new issues and then produces more information on those issues. 
And so, for example, um, I studied the movement that, to deal with violence against women as a global campaign. And, you, and I found that really until 1990s, when the women's movement made an argument in Vienna, the World Human Rights Conference in Vienna, women's rights are human rights, uh, that there was very little attention to violence against women as a global issue, and there was very little data. So what essentially the movement did was it created awareness about women's rights, and especially about violence against women, and it encouraged people to start gathering data on that question. So, but you get this information paradox. You get more data and then people think, oh, there must be more violence against women in the world than ever before because now we have data on it. Um, and so inadvertently you may find that the human rights movement by gathering more data, creating new issues and, and gathering more data may create a, a sense that uh, we have less effectiveness. But I found this, for example, with something like the, well, we'll, we'll get to this later. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to just run through a handful of slides of some of the measures that I use. So this is a measure of genocide and politicide. As you know, genocide is when people uh, in whole or in part are, are eliminated by virtue of their race, religion, nationality. But if people are killed for their politics, it doesn't count as genocide in the definition of genocide in law. And so this measures politicide when, when groups are being eliminated in whole and part by virtue of their political beliefs and genocide. And as you see, that we've seen a, a decline in the world. This is not to diminish our concern about ongoing genocides in the world, something, for example, with the Rohingya people in Burma, uh, but just to say we are now at, at we are now at lower levels than we were in the 1980s and 90s. This is something called deaths of one-sided violence. Okay, so one-sided violence is lethal attacks on uh, civilians, lethal attacks on civilians by governments or formally organized armed groups, okay? Now, this includes Rwanda, that peak in 1993 is Rwanda, but it, it actually is being, it's actually handled by a, logarithmic scale. What that means is if you actually put Rwanda in there without doing it with a logarithmic scale, all the rest of the variation would disappear. There was so much killing in Rwanda. So, but this uh, is able to include Rwanda uh, and looking at uh, um, one-sided violence. Okay, this is my point that some things are getting better and some things are not getting better. These are a number of people displaced by war. And so even though war itself is down, the people displaced by war has increased. This is a, so, so, so the, the problem, okay. One of the problems of this book, and I was reminded of this well by my commentators today, is I really have two big questions. The first question is generated just by these sites I gave you by Eric Poser and Ban Ki-moon. And that is, is the world just getting worse, okay? Is there more suffering? Is there no marked decrease in human rights violations? But the second question, and the more important one, is, and the harder one, is what difference do human rights law, institutions, and movements have made in that, in that improvement? And uh, so this example, I think, is a good one because it, um, it shows the death penalty. Since we're here in the UK, you will remember, some of you will remember that Amnesty International started campaigning about the death penalty in 1977. When Amnesty started campaigning about the death penalty, it's before this, this starts in 1988, so this was before, I think it was about 17 countries had abolished the death penalty by law. Today, as you see, uh, in the current period, we have approximately almost 100 countries who've abolished the death penalty in law, and 140 countries have abolished it in law or practice. In practice means countries that haven't used the death penalty for at least 10 years. Um, and this, uh, there's good evidence believed that, that human rights, movements, and law have made a difference here. Movements like Amnesty campaigning for many years against the death penalty, 
but also law matters. The various human rights treaties have incorporated uh, additional protocols that prohibit the death penalty. And this colleague, Beth Simmons, I mentioned, who looked at that, showed that countries that had ratified those optional protocols in human rights law were more likely to abolish the death penalty in law or in practice. Okay, so here's a, this is a slide about famine, because you might say, okay, fine, maybe, econom maybe political and civil rights, but what about economic and social rights? And um, the famine is the, the, the orange line there. Those are great famines, right, which is a death toll of more than 100,000 people. Um, and I've charted it against population. The green bars are population growth. Now, I could have used population in many of these slides. So all of these trends, many of them are, are in the, the, together with dramatic increases in population. And as you know, you know, Malthus famously predicted that with an uh, increase in population, there would be, of course, an increase in famine. And so it's all the more, uh, I think, striking that we see this decline in famine at the same time as we see an increase in population. Uh, Amartya Sen, you say, well, is this a human rights issue? Isn't it just a food issue? Amartya Sen, the uh, Nobel-winning economist, has, uh, pointed out that, that famine is not about food not being available. Famine is about people not having an entitlement to food. And that's exactly what the right to food means. The right to food means an entitlement, feeling you have an entitlement to food. Um, and so the entitlement to food is an important human right that uh, when people have an entitlement and when they have democratic countries so they can make their voices felt, you don't have famine, basically, and famine's disappearing. Um, you'll ask, however, what about hunger? Of course we care about famine, but what about hunger? And these are two different measures of hunger. One is the, the orange is the absolute number of people in the world who are hungry, and the other line is hu hunger as a percentage of total population. See, both cases, hunger is going down. Um, but here's a good example of it, you know, empirically, we see empirical progress, but it doesn't live up to our ideals. So that dotted line, that orange dotted line, that was the, the, uh, the, world, the world Food Service uh, goal, target it had set for the number of people hungry in the world. And so you see there's a great gap between the goal we have for hunger and the actual amount of hunger still in the world. And so we can see why we can't agree on progress, because if you say, oh, fewer people are hungry, that we could say progress. If you say, no, we wanted that number to drop much more, then we feel uh, despair. Um, and this one, just a final, uh, a final uh, sh uh, slide I wanted to show with you. There's been dramatic improvements in women's rights in various ways. Uh, but in particular, I wanted to talk about women's education, because one of the most striking ones, and this is used as a Gini coefficient. A Gini coefficient, as you know, usually we use it to measure economic inequality, but here it's being used to measure educational inequality in five different areas of education, which are uh, total years of schooling completed, primary school enrollment, secondary school enrollment, tertiary school enrollment, and adult literacy. And so what this graph shows us is that women's inequality in all five areas of education has declined, uh, I think, quite dramatically in the world. Okay, and this, if we broke it down by region, we would find that this is not just in uh, wealthy regions, this is around the world, including in the Middle East. I had a colleague at Radcliffe where I was with John, and the colleague uh, said that, in fact, there are more women than men in the uh, medical school in Saudi Arabia, which I didn't know. So with its pro women's progress education has happened across the board. Um, this is another area we could say, well, how do we interpret this uh, slide, right? These are uh, 25 countries, 21 countries of same-sex marriage is legal, 2015. You could look at it and say, look at that huge gray expanse, right? But then you could say the first country, Netherlands, that legalizes same-sex marriage is in 2000, if you see that chart there. 
Um, and so these are the 21 countries that have happened since 2000 to, uh, to legalize same-sex marriage. Okay, so I see this as empirical evidence of progress. Some people could use a comparison ideal and say only 21 out of 192 countries. Okay, so I want to turn us I have a lot more slides, but I put them in an appendix so I wouldn't bore you with all of them. And I want to turn us, I'm, I hope I persuade you enough that there's a disjuncture here between this, these uh, perceptions of pessimism, there's no, you know, Posner, there's no marked decrease in human rights, or Ban Ki-moon, there's more suffering in the world, that there's a disjuncture between those statements and some of this data. Okay, and so then I want to, to turn to, the, to, to my final question, which is why? Why can't we agree? Why do we have such differing perceptions about what's going on? And I want to try to give you some hypotheses about some of my hunches of what's going on. Okay, these are not things that I have, I can, I can prove to you. These are really things I'm suggesting to you that might explain what's, what's happening here. Um, and the first actually came out of uh, what I, I already talked about in this, this information paradox, right? As monitors look harder for human rights violations, it may appear there are more violations. The, I presented this chapter to, a col to colleagues at the Carr Center for Human Rights at the Harvard Kennedy School, and one of my colleagues from public health said, oh, I know about that. We call it surveillance bias or detection bias in public health. Uh, and that's when the closer you look, the more you find. Right. And so this is not something only limited to, uh, to human rights data. It's limited, it happens in other fields. But in human rights, we have something which I think is really important, which is a changing standard of accountability. And that is the way we defined human rights back in, in you know, the early years, the Universal Declaration, there have been many changes. So I admit 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I did not imagine that we would find it a human right violation not to have a ramp uh, for disabled people to get into buildings. Okay? It just wasn't on my radar screen. And today we have a convention, a global convention, on the rights of disabled people with a very far-reaching legal convention. And, and my, um, you know, my father died last year, but near the end of his life, he was bound to a wheelchair, and I was grateful every day to the human rights activists who'd helped create the convention on, for the people with disabilities. And I realized, how can you talk of people having a right to health, or a right to education, or a right to vote, if they can't even get in the building because there's not a ramp? Okay, so, and, and of course, the convention is about much more than a ramp. But it shows you how even people who are in the human rights world didn't, you know, we have a changing set of accountability about what counts as a human rights violation. And that's good news. It's good news for human rights. But it's, it complicates this idea of progress. Because if we keep raising the bar of what constitutes a human rights violation, it may make it seem like there's more human rights violations when actually we have just care more about human rights and we've created a more robust human rights regime. Um, and these, there's more human rights over time. I made that point, but here's the evidence for it. So this is founding year of human rights organizations. So all these human rights organizations are doing what they do. They're writing reports, right, on more and more, more and more reports on more and more rights. And then human rights law has grown dramatically from the first uh, 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 decades after the Universal Declaration we start having more and more human rights treaties about more and more topics. Um, and uh, I think that's the last one, yes. Um, and so, as I said, we have raised uh, 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 the standard of accountability by defining certain rights more carefully and by creating new human rights. Um, but in addition to the information bias problem, we have some other biases. And these are biases that psychologists have been talking about for a long time. Kahneman and, 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 and Tversky, these are, you see these are old articles I'm showing you. Okay, these are famous guys and these are old articles. And they told us a long time ago there's something called an availability heuristic. If it's easier to imagine or remember an example, we think it's more likely. 
So a good example is terrorism, jihadi terrorism, for example. In the United States, of course, we have uh, on the news all the time about the dangers of jihadi terrorism. Um, people believe it's very prevalent and they are in great danger. Okay? If you look at the data, and this is from my colleague Graham Allison at, at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, he has calculated you are more likely to be killed by a falling tree branch in the United States than you are to be killed by a jihadi terrorist. Now, we're not talking about our own homegrown terrorists and we're not talking about gun violence in the United States. You're many more times likely to be killed by your neighbor or your family uh, with a gun than you are by a terrorist. And yet people are, because of the availability heuristic, they're more afraid of the things that are more available to them. We also have negativity bias and we have recency bias. I told you about recency bias, but negativity bias. People pay more attention to negative information than positive information. And in fact, it's processed in different parts of our brain and we process negative information more completely and more deeply than we do positive information. There were probably good evolutionary reasons for this, okay? The, you know, if you processed negative information like predators, you were more likely to pass on your genes to uh, others. And so there were good reasons for it. Uh, but it gives us a, a bias towards negative news. Remember it better. Whenever I'm speaking to a group of academics, I always give the example of student evaluations. Uh, because we always, you know, it's like, okay, we had 20 people in my class, 19 people loved the class, one person hated the class, gave me all ones. What do I remember? I remember the one person who hated the class not the 19 who liked it. And I think it's a good example of negativity bias. Um, and then, as I already told you about this, uh, we have similar problems with other disciplines, surveillance bias, right, in, in, in public health. So literally, they, if you, they find, like if you put more people, you have a double blind study, you have a control group, and you, you, you put the control group under an MRI machine uh, and do imaging, that group gets sick more, okay? They get sick more not because uh, 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 they actually get sick more, because you're looking closer. And when you look closer, you find uh, uh, diseases you didn't, wouldn't know were there if you didn't look so close. So one of the things that's happening with the human rights uh, world, I would say, our, in, our law, our institutions, and our movements, is we are looking closer than ever before at a wider variety of rights. And because of that, we care more, and we know more than ever before about more rights violations. And I believe that as a result of that, we, be we think that the world is a worse place. Okay. Now, one of my, I'm, I'm, uh, one of my colleagues uh, asked me, and in fact it was, <laughs> it was Octavio, uh, we were just having a drink, and I wasn't drinking. I, I can't drink. I can't drink before I talk. But, <laughs> but uh, and saying, well, but but what's the answer? Okay, and there's no, there's not an easy answer to dealing with uh, uh, surveillance bias, negativity bias, recency bias. Okay, um, it helps at least to be able to put a name to them. So now that I have that name, negativity bias, I see myself doing it all the time. I see my colleagues doing it. Right, uh, or, uh, or now that I have this name surveillance bias, I'm curious about how many other issues in the world in international relations are also subject to surveillance bias, right? People tell me in the world of development, I don't work on development policy, but I understand though some of you do, and people who work in the, uh, in the world of development suggest that maybe there's some surveillance bias or, or, or detection bias there as well. So I'd be interested if you have any ideas of other fields that you're familiar with where you see surveillance bias or detection bias. Um, and so to, to make sure I leave us time for uh, Stephen's comments, but also for your uh, comments and questions, I just want to conclude with a few issues. First, this, uh, you know, people say to me sometimes, oh, you're just an optimist, so you think that way, okay? So I would like to claim this is not about temperament, not about optimism or pessimism, but really about methods and data, okay? Second, 
Another fear people have, and I've heard this, is they fear that if we talk about things improving, we'll get complacent and we'll stop wanting to work on behalf of human rights. Um, now, that perhaps is a danger, but I actually think we're in a different world. If only three, if only you know, four percent of the U.S. public thinks the world's getting better. I think we're not in danger of complacency. I think we're in danger of despair. And I think that it's as equally a problem uh, that, that we are so despairing that we may not be able to sustain uh, uh, continued work on behalf of human rights. Um, other people have said to me, oh, you're telling a triumphalist history. Okay, a teleological triumphalist history. The world is just getting better and better, right? And one, I would like to argue that actually I'm showing you evidence of some things getting better and some things getting worse, right? And I'm saying you go issue by issue, and I am very open to the notion that not, you know, there's both improvement and things getting worse. The, the, but I like empirical comparison because it really lets us identify that. Right? It lets us identify um, uh, what's getting better and what's getting worse. If we're doing comparison to the ideal, it's like having a yardstick with only negative numbers on it. Okay, here's my ideal. We're minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four from uh, my ideal. And so it doesn't really let us see uh, Im improvements as well as retrogression. And so Hirschman, I'm, I'm here quoting Albert Hirschman, the great economist Albert Hirschman, who had a philosophy called possibilism. And I'm saying this is a possibilist history, not a triumphalist one. And by possibilism, he said we have to focus on the realm of possible possibilities, not things that are probable, but things that working together you can make happen. Okay? And so mine is a possibilist history, not a triumphalist one. Uh, and, it's, and it's because this, there's nothing inevitable about human rights progress. Human rights progress has been the result of struggle often struggle led by the disadvantaged people. So women struggling for women's rights, LGBT communities struggling for LGBT rights, okay? And uh, so we shouldn't take it for granted because if people stop struggling, uh, the, the, these improvements will not happen. What I worry about then is that struggle uh, takes anger, but anger's not enough. So there's a famous, uh, U.S. community organizer, Saul Alinsky, is no longer alive, but at one point he said, if you want to bring about social change, you need three things. You need anger, uh, but anger burns out. And so in order to sustain yourself, you also need hope. And then you need to believe you can make a difference. Another colleague who didn't even know Alinsky, he said it differently. He goes, anger is like the spark plug of your car, right? But hope is the gasoline. Um, I have argued not only that you need to know you can make a difference, but this book is about how you can make a difference. It's, and, and that's also important. Not everything works. We have some evidence of, of, of better kinds of policies that, and activism that can lead to improvement. And so it's important not just know we can make a difference, but how we can make a difference. Um, so on that note, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Katrin, uh, for a great talk. Uh, before we open for questions from you, we will have Professor Stephen Hopgood, who is Professor of International Relations and Pro Director at SOAS. His main area of interest is the international politics of humanitarianism and human rights, including the sociology of human rights advocacy. From 2009 to 2012, he held a Leverhulme Major Research Fellowship which culminated in his important book, The End Times of Human Rights, that Catherine cites a few times in her own book, which was also named the, by The Guardian as one of the top 10 books on international struggle. This follows on from his ethnography of Amnesty International, so he is deeply experienced as well in human rights activism, which was another great book called Keepers of the Flame, Understanding Amnesty International, which won the American Political Science Association Best Book in Human Rights Award in 2007. 
He has a deep field in international relations from the University of Oxford, where he, has, he was a student at Murfield College. So I couldn't think of someone better than Stephen to follow from Katrin and give you a different perspective on this topic before we open for a general discussion. Thank you very much, Stephen, for accepting the invitation. Over to you. Thank you. Um, can you, you can hear me okay? Yeah? I won't be long. I've sat where you're sitting. You're dying to answer questions, uh, Catherine, questions, so I promise I won't be too long. One of the perils of sitting there listening, uh, when you've written out some pre-prepared remarks, is that when you've listened to the talk, I, I now will have to read my handwriting. As I'm... Um, whenever my PhD students come to me and they start doing PhDs on human rights, Catherine's work is the first work that I get them to read, although most of them have already read it. So no one has really done more to establish the field of human rights scholarship within international relations than Catherine. And uh, no one has a longer list of books which are pivotal to understanding human rights uh, scholarship than Catherine's. Not just his current book, but books like Activists Beyond Borders are central to understanding human rights. So I want to thank her for making such a cogent and strong argument, as it were, um, uh, for uh, her take on how human rights works. Catherine said at the end there, and I'm just going to make a few quick remarks uh, and then I'll, I'll sit down. Catherine said at the end then, there's nothing inevitable about human rights progress. And honestly, really, that is the position that I'm taking and I'm trying to argue for that in my own work. There's nothing inevitable about human rights progress. And if you, if you looked at my uh, work, you'd see that I give due credit, I think, to the things that have been, that have been achieved by the human rights movement. But I want to make uh, a series of claims about the, the current situation we're in and suggest that there are profound threats, not just to human rights. Human rights, for me, are a subset of a broad set of liberal norms, liberal rules, and ideas about international law, which I think are profoundly in question in the contemporary um, situation. Uh, Catherine talks about despair. I, I like the famous Gramsci quote where he says, modernity is about living uh, without illusions, but without becoming disillusioned. And that's really my version, if you like, of pessimism. So what points do I want to make here? The first is around legitimacy. I think that there's a challenge to the legitimacy of the global human rights regime, which is more profound than any it's experienced since the post-Second uh, World War period. Why do I think this? First of all, because I think the major states which have been responsible for uh, enacting and trying to um, uh, support global human rights law frequently for reasons to do with their own foreign policies, and I'll come back to that, those states are progressively weaker. So although Catherine has demonstrated e extremely convincingly, as have other scholars, that the origins of human rights don't just lie amongst <coughs> the, the usual suspects, Western states, for me, it's the, the, the um, coming together of the interests of a state like the United States or a Western European state and the human rights discourse, which has led to their globalization and the creation of a whole series of institutions uh, and laws and treaties to support it. Um, and for me, the International Criminal Court is central to this, and the European states are the states that are really underwriting uh, that court. So with China, with Russia, but also a whole series of other states, Brazil, Indonesia, India, Nigeria. These are all states, most of which were former colonies, who have, are now entering a world which has rules they did not write and laws they were not fundamentally part of creating. And led by China, I would suggest they're beginning to challenge those laws. And so my first argument in terms of legitimacy is what happens to human rights all the way down to the local level if the global legitimacy of human rights is now challenged by a set of alternative norms or a set of norms which were familiar to pre-human rights activists, which is the overwhelming importance and preeminence of sovereignty, which is effectively the position that China takes in the international system. So that's my first question, fundamental uh, challenge to the um, uh, legitimacy of human rights. A second one linked to that is the, for me, unremitting hypocrisy of much Western human rights foreign policy. Now, this doesn't really matter for most of the post-Cold War period. Either the US and its allies have such an overwhelming interest in working together to challenge the Soviet Union that the degree to which 
There is rank hypocrisy everywhere. Doesn't, doesn't undermine, as it were, their shared goal of defeating communism. Once you get into the post-Soviet period, in fact, in some ways, it becomes even more the case because the United States goes through 15 or 20 years of effective um, uh, um, uh, dominance of the international system and relative hegemony. That begins to run out in the 2000s. And so not only do we have a series of challenges to those global norms, but what we now have is a, a, a sustained attack on the hypocrisy of um, Western human rights commitments. So th that hypocrisy is now challenged. It's now evident. I find, it, I, feel, I find it with my own students. Many of the academics in the room will find it with their students. These arguments about decolonization uh, of the curriculum, decolonization of universities, challenging the hegemony of a particular Western vision, and, and uh, attacking the um, claims to moral uh, authority made by the United States and other Western European states in particular. And I think that's reached a, a fever pitch uh, in the contemporary environment as well. Um, the third uh, point I want to make is I want to uh, ask you to think about how deep does human rights observance go? I don't really have any complaint with most of what, what Catherine has argued, but how deep does the commitment to human rights go within our own society, within a society like the UK? You've seen recently in relation to the European Union a, a degree of callousness in relation to refugees, for example, that would have been shocking if you'd said this is how Europe would respond to the needs of various refugees. It doesn't go particularly deep. That would be my argument. And um, if you look at the attitudes often of human rights supporters uh, in relation to things like distributive, redistributive taxation, for example, you find a reluctance to vote for redistributive taxation even at the same time as you might get the same people supporting human rights, particularly the human rights of others internationally rather than with their own um, societies. And this leads into um, a, a, an observation about the speed with which populism has gained ground. That, for me, is the shocking thing. Not that you have people who are anti-freedom of speech or anti-freedom of the press or anti-democratic. All open, free societies have these people. But the speed with which you can build up 25, 30, 35% of the population who vote or express a who will support positions which are antithetical to human rights, even in the heartland of Europe, even in countries like Denmark, Scandinavia, attitudes to immigration, attitudes to Islam, you can find uh, that sort of wellspring of skepticism about some core human rights ideas is actually substantial, even when the, within those places. We would have assumed that if human rights had really been institutionalized, it would be embedded at a really deep level. Um, uh, a couple more points and then I'll stop. The second really, uh, the, the next point really is around effectiveness and I want to make two points here. The first is, a, 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 which will seem a more nerdy academic point perhaps, but there's no real counterfactual for a world without human rights. So we just assume that the world with human rights has got to be better than the world that didn't have human rights. But you can, of course, make a counterfactual argument in a variety of ways about what that world might have looked like. I'm going to make two sorts of our, uh, claims here, but you'll be able to come up with others. One is, does human rights activism displace other more effective forms of activism? So for me, the real origins of the modern human rights movement come in the 1960s and the 1970s because the organised left collapses. Many uh, left activists go into human rights movements as a way to do positive things in the world, but they cease to be able to effectively organise as leftist parties, socialist parties, communist parties, whatever, what have you. Maybe without human rights, there would be a quicker return, particularly in the neoliberal era, to a more galvanised leftist position on, on deregulation of the um, markets on, on, uh, and the significant growth in inequality within uh, particularly developed societies. A second argument would be that it actually provides an alibi for people who otherwise might be forced to uh, accept they should redistribute more of their income by saying, but we're the good people because we spend a lot of time and money helping people in other societies with their basic human rights. So when you say to us, you should redistribute more of your income, we say, but we are helping people who suffer. And in fact, the people who suffer most are people who uh, live on $2 a day, 
that's where we're active with them, or the people, or the people who are subject to sex trafficking, or ch street children, all those things where it would seem there's a more profound human rights uh, um, uh, um, issue than those people who would claim within the society that they should get a greater share of the um, uh, surplus. Um, uh, and a final point, and then I'll stop. That final point is when, and I think Catherine, Catherine did this in her slides, Stephen Pinker does this very much in his work and many other um, uh, 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 arguments too. There are many things we can point to where things seem to be getting better, but to what extent is the growth of the human rights regime responsible for these improvements? That, that's, that's my question. Where's the causation there? Human rights can be part of a whole series of things which appear to be getting better, but if we think about something like famine, maybe neoliberal globalization is a big part of the reduction in the level of famine. And so we're not, we can't lay that at the door of human rights. What we have to say is human rights are one part of that, but maybe rampant capitalism has actually been quite good for reducing the level of poverty, absolute poverty. It may not help those people get to be much wealthier, but it's dragged them out of absolute poverty. Human rights is a small part of that story. And so we have to be careful claiming too much for human rights. Um, and I think the reason we do it is, and I'm as much uh, a victim of this as others, there's a comforting teleology about the degree to which the development within wealthier and richer societies, we assume, is a development which the societies that are currently transitioning into uh, high-income um, um, uh, high countries will follow the same transition. Uh, but maybe if we look at China, we're going to get a, a high-income country without any political freedom and certainly without the state supporting the idea of human rights for all. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So now we have... Oh, time for questions. And Mitten is the microphone for you to ask your questions and have it recorded. If you could uh, briefly say your name and where you come from, if you want. So there is one there of you. Uh, Ewan McGahey, King's College London. Um, thanks for a great talk uh, with lots of positivity bias. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to perhaps make uh, uh, similar points. Um, I, I, um, I entirely agree with you that uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about. You've got, got to be right. Um, but if I think about the two biggest challenges that face our society as a globe, or um, also within the UK, or if I was thinking about the US, I'd have to pick uh, number one, climate damage, uh, and number two, inequality. And so um, I, I agree that you know, the, the, the method and data that you use backs up what you say on the points that you make about sort of bare minimum standards of human rights in relation to conflict. Uh, but if we looked at uh, a global carbon emissions um, uh, graph, we, we'd see that it's abysmal. And that's important because there's no human rights on a dead planet. Um, so, you know, you've got to, uh, I think if, if you're going to say that things are, are getting better, um, you, you've got to uh, take into account, you, you know, really, I think this is an eclipsing issue. Um, then with inequality as well, it's, um, it is getting worse and worse. And if we looked at the United States, um, you know, wages have flatlined since the 1970s, obesity is up, uh, life expectancy is now flatlining. Um, it's, it's really not a good state of affairs, um, you know, on, on the data. Um, so I, I, I wonder if, you know, it's actually a good thing to be uh, negative uh, and, and not so um, optimistic because then we concentrate on solving problems. Thank you. Should we collect a few and then uh, answer? That's yeah, fine. so uh, the lady in the back there, please. Hi, Elaine Fahey, uh, City University of London City Law School. I suppose I'm a lawyer and I find 
a lot about this, quite interesting, but also quite problematic. And I'm just wondering about your, your view of in international institutions and organizations. Take, for example, you know, African countries leaving the International Criminal Court, the Trump administration nobbling the WTO, the uh, UK leaving the EU and potentially the ECHR. Shortly, you know, what's your view in international organizations and exit from that? Is that negativity bias that all the lawyers that I know are working on exit from international organizations, or is it just fact? <laughs> Thank you. A third question uh, here on the, the right, please, and then we'll, we'll go to the, the left. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carolina. I'm studying at King's College, and I was wondering uh, throughout your talk, what is it that you actually take as human rights? So what is it that you're actually trying to measure? How would you define uh, human rights? Is that a particular, is that just a concept, an idea? And how do you then um, operationalize, operationalize uh, the concept? So what would you include? What would you exclude? And this also relates back to um, the question that you had about climate change. So. Um, what, what is it that you're deliberately leaving out of your argument, and what is it that you include? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll answer these three and then collect uh, three more. Yeah. So let me start with the last question. because it, So when I define human rights, I start with existing human rights law. That's why I showed you that long list of law. Um, and most of my measures would be measures that you would use you could use to measure rights that are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, but, um, but as you see, I have some other things like the uh, LGBT uh, um, rights that are emerging rights, and so I try to be attentive also to the fact that there are demands for new rights. And that turns me to the issue of climate change because, of course, people are now trying to make rights issues around climate change. We have a right to clean environment, trees have rights, rivers have rights, Pachamama, the earth goddess, has rights in the uh, Bolivian and Ecuadorian constitutions, okay? And I actually think that there are issues, uh, uh, I'm not opposed to the earth goddess having rights, but I think that there are issues where rights don't get us very far. And climate change is one of them. And I, my new book, my next book, is, is called What Together We Can Do, Embracing Responsibilities in the Age of Rights. And so with regard to climate change, I would say rights talk by itself doesn't get us very far. And in order to deal with a pressing issue like climate change, we have to stress the responsibilities. And here I'm drawing on Iris Marion Young's book, Responsibility for Justice. And that is, it's no longer enough to have the, the blame model, the liability model. We have to have a forward-looking responsibility model where all institutions and uh, individuals connected to the structural injustice of climate change need to act to, and able to act, need to act together and they need to act soon. And so I think that, that increasingly to implement some rights, we need to turn to uh, a responsibilities model, a rights and responsibilities model and really focus on responsibilities. Um, and that includes responsibilities of states, of course, of corporations, but not only states and corporations. It's easy to say, oh, climate change, you know, but it turns out that we individuals have responsibilities as well. Uh, at least at the Harvard Kennedy School, we're working on getting uh, the way that, that international relations academics most contribute to climate change is through international travel. And by one trip coming to London, I erase almost everything else I do for climate change every year. And so one thing people are going to have to think about seriously is travel and our responsibility around travel. So, um, but, uh, so that's kind of my answer to your climate change question. But I want to, I want to, um, okay, okay, there. Um, I want to talk about inequality because indeed inequality is the challenge, after climate change is one of the challenges of our age. But there's, there's, inequality is a complicated issue. And first I want to say, you know, there's, there's various kinds of inequality. Used to be we were very concerned about inequality between countries, right? This was the new economic, international economic order. Inequality between countries in the world has declined, okay? It's partly due to, the, of course, the growth of China and India, um, but so, so, so oddly, 
people don't talk about this, but we actually have less inequality between countries, and that means that if we take all the individuals of the world, there's less inequality between individuals in the world. But there's more inequality within countries, and that's what we're concerned about, rightly so, including within countries like China and India, who have helped contribute by, by their economic growth to a decline in global inequality, they are having more internal inequality. Okay, so let's turn to the issue of internal inequality. I don't know if you can see this very easily, but this is uh, um, on the slide here. We have the inequality in English-speaking countries follows this U curve. This is USA in the top and the UK after, but also Canada, Ireland, Australia. Okay, we have more inequality today within our countries than we did at any time since 1913 for some of us, okay? This is inequality in uh, uh, continental Europe and Japan. It follows this L-shaped curve, right? We only have these countries because it uses income tax data, and you just don't have long time series of income tax data from too many places. But what it means is that inequality is also not inevitable with globalization, and that countries of, uh, uh, of continental Europe and Japan have used social policy as a means of mitigating inequality, right? So we're not helpless with regard to inequality, but countries have to adopt social policy, and for various reasons, the English-speaking countries of the world are not doing a good job at that, and we have to figure out how to do a better job. Um, <coughs> the, uh, okay, and the final question, international institutions. Well, I'm not gonna wade into your debate here about Brexit, but um, I don't think that, that institutional dissatisfaction is just a fact that we should all accept. Um, but uh, but um, I, I teach a class on uh, global governance, and I've, you know, here's an area that Steve and I have had differences on, so maybe we should talk about those differences. Um, so Steve has argued uh, that you have human rights, small h, small r, those are social movements in the developing world who are doing this important human rights work. And then you have human rights, capital H, capital R, which are the institutions, human rights institutions, and they're really the problem, okay? I believe that there's more, con uh, more connection between the, the, the human rights, capital H, capital R, and little h, little r. Because I have watched human rights activists, and I study human rights activists around the world, help create institutions, okay? So the Latin American, people committed to human rights created the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And they used the Inter-American Commission, they infused it by sending cases forward to the Inter-American Commission. And so I don't see it as Inter-American Commission, the bad guys, uh, small, you know, human rights activists, the good guys, but rather to, you know, to do work on a global scale, you need not only social movements, you also need institutions. And human rights institutions, including the International Criminal Court, have an important role to play as a backstop. They're not the first or, the, you know, they're not the place we should start, right? But if, uh, if there's mass atrocity going on and countries have refused to do anything about it, including prosecute their leaders, having an institution wh whose job it is to prosecute people for mass atrocity is a useful backstop in that system. Well, backstop is a very sensitive word at the moment <laughs> oh, in this country, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> in Brexit. Let's move I on forgot. to a, a, a next round of questions. We had a lady here who had her hand uh, up for some time. Where are you? No? So this, this gentleman then with glasses, and then you move it to the right. There are three people in the same row wanting to <coughs> ask questions. Um, th thank you. My name's Malcolm Evans. I'm professor of international law at Bristol University. But perhaps more pertinent, I am, and for the last eight years, have been chair of one of the UN human rights treaty bodies. Um, I suppose two questions, if, 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 I, if I may, flowing out from the very interesting comments uh, mm -hmm. that we've received this evening. The first is that I think the fundamental premise of the first paper is that there is a connection between human rights, I suppose, hope and happiness. That sounds like the title of another book. Um, but 
Is that really the case? I suppose in the area in which I work, which is to do with, with torture, we try to secure rights, but frankly, we're not really that focused or believing that we're delivering much by way of hope and happiness. And so trying to equate them as if progress in relation to human rights necessarily produces delivery of other human goods, shall we say, and the two things are completely intertwined, is that just expecting too much of what a rights-based movement can actually achieve? And I think the second thing is possibly related to that. It does strike me, listening to the presentations, that among the many, many developments that have taken place over the years, there's been a rather important shift in what we think human rights are actually meant to achieve. If we look back at the very early instruments, they were very much aspirational in the good sense of the word, adopted by states to try to show others what minimum standards should be and what should be achieved. Yet now, from a practical perspective, we frighten states off from human rights compliance by always using the language of breach and violation. And so inevitably they turn away from human rights. And I think um, uh, uh, Stephen Hopgood is absolutely right about the pushback about it. But is that our own fault? Because rather than trying to achieve human rights compliance through more positive means, we are simply trying to achieve compliance through negative means of breach and violation, which actually make those, it, those outcomes more difficult to, to bring about. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm a PhD candidate here at King's. My name is Sapna. Um, I really found your argument on bias quite interesting because it made me think about John Burge's work on ways of seeing where he describes about you see the world and then you have a word and then you try to describe the world with those words. Uh, when you were talking about the optimistic accounts of human rights and you used domestic violence and decrease in domestic violence against women uh, as one of your uh, sources of data. Don't you think there is a detection bias when we start looking at the success of human rights as well? Because it gives a framework, human rights framework, allows us to look for successes in certain avenues and in certain um, actors and try to map those successes along those avenues. And as a result of which we find success of human rights, but in the same time, it does not fully capture the way that human rights is experienced or the way it is experienced by people in the peripheries or in avenues that are in the periphery. So I was a bit um, disillusioned by the fact of like, how are you using the success data and are you also considering the detection bias that kind of factors in the optimistic data for human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Christopher Rosanides. I'm a PhD candidate at King's College London School of Law, working on legitimacy. So we have seen, I, I have seen both you know, very well argued, um, very well evidenced arguments, both on a sociological level. And it makes one wonder how these two arguments connect, my first response was that they seem to depend on different standards without implying that one is right and one is wrong. So on the one hand, you're saying, well, you know, we are ranking now lower in HR compliance because, well, as humans, we, we see what we're looking for, right? Uh, we look closer, so we find more problems. So it's not necessarily that we always rank lower, but now we look closer, so we find more problems. On the other hand, the other argument, you are, you're looking at, uh, at, evidences, at evidence such as how deep our commitment to HR is, and even if there has been a woman to the HR, maybe the world would have been better off without it because it'll, something else would have happened, the counterfactuals and so on and so forth. So to, to double question, one, when it comes to connecting these two, not discussions, but these two arguments, I was wondering if you could find an objective standard to connect them based on the specificity on human rights. So if, like Thomas Frank's work, right, so if the legal norm is more specific, then it has this pull to compliance. And the other one, and I think that's my main claim, is whether the two arguments are not necessarily mutually exclusive because they don't quite connect. Maybe the first argument is more about whether there is a stronger human rights compliance per se. The other argument is whether we are actually, even if there is on certain, based on certain evidence, a higher human rights compliance, 
whether we're actually better off with it or than without it. That is a slightly better argument. It may be, I may be a bit unfair because that focuses more on your, on your fourth point than the other two, but I still want to push the question if you don't seem, if you don't feel this unfair. Thank you. Thank you. A question for Steve uh, as well. So Steve, do, you, do you want to start? Or do you oh, no, I'm not ready. You go. Yeah. <laughs> I assumed you were, so yeah. I did. <laughs> um, okay, so um, to Malcolm's point, um, so the, the notion of kind of w whether we should, we are expecting too much, I think is a, was a, a very interesting one, you know, and, and, and certainly there are whole areas of human rights where your point is we need to like build capacity is an important one. So uh, the human rights movement did long assume that human rights violations were due to the unwillingness of a state to protect human rights. But I think now, and this is in my, in, in the book, The Persistent Power of Human Rights with Thomas Risa, we made the argument that there are both states that are unwilling to uh, 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 protect human rights, and there are states that are unable to protect human rights. And there's some states that are unwilling and unable to protect human rights. And depending on which of those areas you're in, you need a different strategy. So if you're really with a country that, and, and on the torture issue, I assume that you do find this, you're really with a country that would like to, st to limit torture, but is having trouble with state capacity finding out how to do that, how to work with their police in far-flung police stations, then I completely agree with you that capacity building is the way to go, okay? But there are other areas where you can build capacity until you're blue in the face, but the government is committed to, to human rights violations as a matter of state policy. So let's say Argentina during the, the you know, dictatorship. It, you know, there was no lack of state capacity. In fact, they were using tremendous state capacity to disappear thousands and thousands of people, torture and disappear thousands of people and drop them sedated and live into the South Atlantic. In that situation, I don't think reasoning with people helps, okay? So I do, so I do think we have to distinguish between where it's a, it's a building capacity issue where reason, and most of the UN system, as you know well and as you practice, most of the UN system is about dialogue, right? It's about universal periodic review, it's about uh, what happens in the treaty bodies, okay? Um, and a lot of good can come from that dialogue. My point is, there are some people, who, who, however, who, who no amount of dialogue is going to do the job. And my own research on mass atrocity suggests that, yes, human rights prosecutions of high-level individuals involved in mass atrocity is associated with improvements, <laughs> okay? In other words, there are some people in the world, and whether it's the Pinochets or the, or the, Milo, uh, the Milosevic's, uh, or for that matter, I think, uh, I'm, I'm deeply disappointed that no one in the US government was ever prosecuted for torture. They should have been prosecuted for torture. That would have created a deterrent effect so that Donald Trump wouldn't run around uh, glorifying torture today. But we didn't deal with that culture through uh, appropriate means, which is we have law in the United States, not just, we didn't just ratify the torture convention, we also have domestic law, which prohibits torture, and yet nothing was done to hold anyone accountable, and that has led to bad outcomes in my country. And so I believe that we need these more forceful means for some individuals who will only be dissuaded by the threat of prosecution. Um, so, uh, okay, detection bias. Um, so on the detection bias issue, uh, and I should I, I, I want to clarify what I said about violence against women because actually I didn't present any data on violence against women. I don't have good data on violence against women, and I don't have it because we we haven't been collecting it long enough to have data to say one thing or another. So we can't say today, for example, there's more rape in the world because we just don't know if there's more rape in the world. And so I, I, I hope I didn't misrepresent that, but, uh, but I do, um, and I, I do think that if we look at how human rights violations are experienced by people, 
we find that yes, my point, of, the kind of thing I'm presenting does not make a victim of human rights satisfied at all, okay? In other words, if you are a victim of, and I know this from talking to many Argentines where I do research, if your son or daughter was disappeared by the dictatorship, you know, I can, I can tell you that Argentina is the country of the world that has had more human rights prosecutions than any other country. In other words, in a comparative sense, it's done the most. But if you're a, 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 a parent of a disappeared person, and if the person who tortured your son or daughter has not been held accountable, you don't give a damn. And I get the, what I would say is this, is you know, we have different roles, and it's important to, to and human rights activists around the world are providing services to victims to, 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 who are experiencing the pain of any individual human rights violation is unacceptable, and they experience it that way. But I'm a social scientist, and my job is to try to look at trends over time and try to think about change and causality. And so uh, I still need to tell the Argentines, you know, they say, it's complete impunity in this country. That's what many people say. I say, I know people perceive it that way, but I have a database of prosecutions of all countries around the world, and Argentina has done more to hold people accountable, to have truth commissions, to pay reparations, to have uh, memory sites than any country in the world. So in an ideal sense, it, it's, it's impunity for you, but in a comparative sense, it is the country that's doing the most. And I don't know how to reconcile that between how victims perceive human rights violations as real to them, and no one wants to ever deny the, the pain that individual victims feel or minimize that pain. But as a social scientist, uh, I have to take a different approach. Okay, Steve, are you ready? Uh, but the, I, I couldn't quite get the point you were making about compliance, so could you restate it? Two arguments. Sorry, because uh, I thought these were two arguments that Catherine made. So I Cor I correct. Uh, yeah. Apologies for the confusion. I yeah. was referring to two arguments, as in the first argument presented by Professor Catherine, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, and the argument presented by you. So the first yeah. argument being that well, it's not necessarily the case that now we have lower human rights compliance. It may be that that's just we think we do because now we're looking closer yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. And right. So my point is whether it is the case that the two arguments are asking very, very relevant, but slightly different questions. The first being whether, the, the first being whether now there is a higher or lower human rights compliance per se, which despite the, I understand that it's a social research, so the, all the evidence we saw was, was sociological, descriptive, non-normative, non, non I get it. But the issue per se is whether with the human rights norms as they are, whether there has been compliance. That's a, that's a formalistic question. And whether your answer, whether your argument also will evidence, but it supports a slightly different question, whether regardless of that human rights compliance, we are actually better off. So it, I'm wondering if your, if your evidence points to the fact that it's not necessarily the case that we have a lower human rights compliance per se, but what does that actually mean? That was my point. Okay, and, and I, yes, there's a, there's, the, there would be a whole variety of ways to address that question. Uh, Catherine in her work is obviously right that we measure a huge amount more about human rights um, abuses. And so that question of just the amount of data we have that makes everything suddenly seem like it's getting worse, but in fact we just didn't know what was going on before or we didn't record what was going on before must be um, absolutely right. This, the, the, the idea that uh, despite, I'm, I'm taking this to be that despite the level of compliance, uh, you want to know whether even if I accept that level of compliance, I think things are... Right, so essentially you could make your argument accepting the level of compliance from Professor Catherine's yep. argument. Yep. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. So where, from that point on, where does your argument take us? That the, the, point, the point we're now at is right. not a stable point necessarily. So if we, we may see the best levels of compliance we're ever going to see, and we're just about to see an unraveling of compliance, and you, you may see that in relation, the beginnings of that in relation to torture, maybe you'll see it in relation to the death penalty, 
or maybe in relation to the death penalty, states will just get savvy. I mean, that's one thing we haven't really talked about, the sort of playbook, the lawfare playbook of savvier states. So it's not good publicity just to gun people down. So it's better to cut off their funding and make them illegal so that they can't organize, uh, to extradite them, to ethnically cleanse them. In the death penalty, maybe you get rid of the death penalty, but you just impose harsh sentences on people and, uh, and lock them up for the entirety of their lives in, in horrific conditions. So it looks like it's a human rights gain, and we see there's much more compliance, but in reality, people are still suffering significant human rights abuses on a, on a, on a wider scale. So I think the, I don't, I don't think I need to disagree uh, with Catherine about the level of compliance we've got. My position is how stable is that in the contemporary environment? And there's a whole series of headwinds uh, that question both the legitimacy of human rights norms at the global level, but we also see the unraveling uh, of at least the, the uh, apparent commitment to human rights in many, many societies. So uh, one of the early questions talked about, I don't think the UK will leave the European Court of Human Rights, but that does have traction in the Conservative Party here. Just look what's happening in Brazil. That, you know, that, that's a pretty, from, from the era of Lula, it's a pretty rapid unravelling to, uh, you know, a, frankly, a fascist homophobe being... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, running the government. Now, of course, that could just be transitory, like Trump could be transitory, and the next person will just say, okay, sorry about all of that, business as usual will be, will be resumed. But I think, I think there's a profound structural change in the way power and influence is uh, uh, um, distributed internationally, unlike any that we've seen for potentially 200 years. And that's the decline of initially the Europeans and then the United States as the dominant states together in the international system. The future will be the Asia Pacific. The future will be China, India, Southeast Asia, the west coast of the United States, yes. But that's going to be the pivotal trading regime. And that, that means, you know, we just don't know what that, that looks like. Someone was complaining to me the other day about Chinese tourists. And that, you know, they won't do up their seatbelts on planes. Or I don't know whether this is true or not. And what she, but what she said was, but of course, this is what empires must have looked like. These people arrive from elsewhere and just refuse to do what they're asked to do and start saying, well, you know, we have our own set of norms. <laughs> that, I, that, that might be the world that we're entering in relation to human rights too, which is, okay, these are your rules, but our rules are very different, and we now need to have a conversation about that. Sorry. I think we need to meet up again in 10 or 20 years' time yeah. to see, like, who is, is right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid I have to draw this to a close. As I mentioned, uh, we've started quite early today, and I don't want to be accused of <laughs> violating Catherine's human rights to <laughs> maximum <laughs> hours of work. So I thank you all so much for coming, and Stephen Hopgood for uh, coming, Catherine Seeking for your lecture, everyone who is here. Thank you so much, and I think, please join me uh, thanking the, the speakers of this evening. <laughs>